so much for inviting me here. Uh, uh, I'm really humbled to be part of this program. I hope I'm audible, right? Could you please, someone please confirm? Yes, yes sir. Audible. Good. Yeah, so thanks a lot. I'm really privileged uh, to be part of this program. And uh, at the onset, congratulations for this um, uh, inauguration of your YouTube channel. Very nice name. Uh, and uh, yes, so, you know, the name is Floralis, right? So very nice. I hope you, you uh, produce a large number of very interesting programs there and introduce new, new, you know, the, the endemic species, Kerala is full of beautiful plant species, right? And it's used, all those things I hope you will cover there. And uh, yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I came up today with a, a brief presentation because the topic is about my uh, Antarctic trip. So allow me to share my screen now. A second, let me show you. Okay. Good. I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So it's science in Antarctica and uh, especially on discovery of the Brian Parathiense. So first of all, thank you, Dr. Binoy T. Thomas, for inviting me to be part of this program. Um, Dr. Binoy has been in touch with me for quite some time now, uh, asking me to deliver a talk on the, the scopes first, right? You, you suggested this topic and then uh, why not uh, about my Antarctic trip? And uh, Dr. Filippos Uman, uh, your principal, very nicely, briefly, he uh, introduced this program. And yes, so my uh, humble regards to you, sir. And yes, so uh, overall, the uh, my today's talk uh, will be for around 30 minutes and I'm open for any of your questions, right? You may interrupt me, no problem, okay? Anytime, if you have any questions to ask about my findings or about my what uh, other stuff which I do and also about Antarctica any questions you have in your mind you may please ask me uh, during this interaction right so uh, first of all I'll uh, give you a brief intro to the discovery per se uh, the discovery of the Brahm uh, you know this Brahm Parati and so this discovery has been featured quite extensively in all the media including the BBC and many other international media so what actually makes it so special Antarctica, you know, it's a very interesting continent, continent of ice. Almost 99% of the landmass is uh, completely occupied by two ice sheets, East Antarctic ice sheet and West Antarctic ice sheets, massive ice sheets. And uh, there are only a few ice-free oases, the so-called oases. These are nothing but rocky place. Like here, you can see that one such area is the Schirmacher oasis, another such area right here is called Larsman Hills with isolated, uh, you know, the rocky places. So I've, I've been to both these places because this, these are the, the home to two of the Indian Antarctic stations, right? Larsman Hills have got Bharati. Uh, the name of this species is after the station Bharati and also after India. I will just come in a short while. And Shumakaroasis is the place where we have our station called Maitri. So I've got two stations in Antarctica, Bharati and Maitri. And I was part of the Indian Antarctic mission, 2016 to 2017. And I got the chance to do the uh, research uh, both the stations uh, in its vicinities, you know. So while walking around this station in Bharati, Bharati is somewhere here. So of course we go around in helicopter usually. And also there are snow scooter or skidoo and also piston bully. Piston bully is like a, a military tank, you know, so that can travel in the ice. So while going around these areas, I found that these are islands, you know, and of course, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, nothing but Antarctic Ocean or Southern Ocean, which is completely frozen near Antarctica. So uh, while wandering around the Lostman Hills, I found, I stumbled upon uh, the algal, uh, I mean, moss mat near the penguin colonies. And this, this is how it looks like in the Fisher Island and MacLeod Island to be specific. And uh, this is really nice matte looking. And uh, yeah, it was just my curiosity how the moss can live in Antarctica because 
Antarctica doesn't even have any soil, you know, so there is no source of nitrogen and phosphorus and how the moss can live in. So most uh, reports in Antarctica itself is pretty rare, you know, and uh, yeah, so then I was really uh, curious and I collected a sample, I got back here. So that curiosity is extremely important. The childlike curiosity, I keep on, yeah, I mean, science communication is so, uh, my passion, you can say. So I've been communicating uh, as part of the KSSP, that is Kerala Chastra Sahitya Parishad for quite some time. And also uh, in Niaz, that is, uh, in, uh, you know, that uh, INSA, Indian National Science Academy, is a young academy called uh, INYAS, Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. So, uh, you know, when I, uh, I still remember one occasion where I went to Mahi. Mahi is a Mayeri, you know, uh, near Kannur, right? So I went to a temple. The temple invited me to give a talk on my Antarctic expedition. So one kid, a small uh, child, uh, you know, a uh, girl uh, stood up and she asked me the question, like, how fish can live in Antarctica, you know, Antarctic Ocean? So I didn't have an answer that time. It is completely curiosity driven question. No? So later I came to know that the fish have got this antifreeze protein in its blood. Uh, it was discovered only very late, you know, a few years back, two, three years back, a report published in PNAS. So that kind of questions only kids usually ask. But after this formal education, uh, you know, uh, lasting for many years, then the, the, they keep on changing the way that they, they ask the questions. Like uh, a, a kid can, ask, uh, you know, a child can ask questions like, why we yawn? What is the reason why human, we, we yawn, you know? Or why do we have goosebumps? All these questions are really curious to everyone. At the same time, when these kids grew up, their kind of questions completely change. They will ask like how to earn more money or how to live longer, how to treat cancer. <laughs> you know, these are the questions that they are. So that curiosity, we should never kill it. You know, so the, because this is an inauguration of the science club botany association, right? And that curiosity is really, really important. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, there is no soil, how it can grow. So, you know, that you can, uh, you can find an answer if you analyze the, the nitrogen content of this nitrogen and phosphorus content. You know, these are uh, uh, mosses, of course, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, extract the, the nitrogen and phosphorus, and then if you radiometrically rate uh, the ratio of the normal isotope uh, you know so the baseline with the isotope so basically nitrogen coming to the nitrogen it is n14 is a normal one right while n15 is a heavier one you know so the heavier one uh, the lighter one is n14 there is a normal one so heavier one the animals have got this tendency to excrete it so you know so we excrete the heavier one so uh, the lighter one keep on accumulating so basically we we check the ratio of n15 to n14 and the ratio will tell you the source of uh, the nitrogen so what we found repeated studies have found that in in uh, antarctica in general nitrogen uh, you know the the isotope of nitrogen in the moss is the same thing that is in the animal not in the plants you know, so that means that it's actually coming, getting this nitrogen from animal source. So what does that mean? Is it a carnivorous? No. The reason is very simple that it actually coincides with what I observed. You know, that the moss can occur only in uh, the locations of penguins because penguins have the excrete. Excreta contains a lot of, uh, uh, you know, nitrates and phosphate because this is an excellent fertilizer, you know. And uh, the poop, you know, the penguin poop, right? Guano, right? So the guano is a good fertilizer. So that is how it can survive. Now, the second question is that how does the moss can survive during the pitch dark months of six months of the uh, austral winters, polar winter? Right now it is winter in Antarctica. Do you know Antarctica is a very special place? Uh, six months of the winter followed by six months of summer. Summer is also like, uh, you know, the winter is really cold. But the stark difference is that during the six month of winter, there is no sun at all. It's continuous pitch dark, followed by the six month of summer. Summer, the sun never sets. So Antarctica has got only two, uh, you know, sunrise or sunset. Only one sunrise per year that happens in September equinox. Equinox is coming next, next week, right? 23rd of September is the equinox. And uh, uh, 
uh, yes, so the March equinox is when Antarctica slips into six months of continuous winter, pitch dark winter. So during the winter time, how it can grow? So it's very interesting. Uh, no photosynthesis happens, right? It's dark. And more than that, on the top of this uh, area, you will see around 10 meters of snow. So it's, it's, we don't have an answer, but probably it will uh, go to the uh, dormant state. And when uh, you know, September equinox happens and snow start melting and then start germinating once again. So we did morphological assessment and we could find a large number of synapomorphic traits, including with lanceolate leaves with the long accumulate apex and decurrent reflex rate margins, percurrent costa and so on, right? We, you need to have a large number of unique morphological traits called synapomorphic characters. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is our sixth discovery, right? Uh, and after this, we discovered yet another, that is basically as a double area, uh, Nikai, not from Antarctica, but from Andaman and Nicobar Island. So all these species discoveries, you know, so if, I, if you ask me what were my previous names of this algae and moss, of course, the first algae which I ever discovered, this, these are seaweed, you know, mostly my discoveries are in seaweed and these are only moss. The first one is Ulva Paschima. So because it's found only in the Western coast of India. And Cladophora goensis, it's found in Goa. Then Ulva uniciriata, it's a uniciriate filaments. So see, uh, the, the rationale is very simple. I name the species either after the place or after uh, you know, the unique botanical features. I never name after persons. The reason is again, very simple. If I name after one person who is living, which is now common trend among plant taxonomists, you know, even my own friends do that. They name after their friends and their friends name after them. Quid pro quo, you rub my back, I rub your back. Very bad practice. The reason is simple. What will happen if that person turns out to be a murderer or a rapist? You, you know that the person's legacy can change over a lifetime. But once you name, that name is always associated with that, uh, the taxa, you know, you are discovering a new species, uh, the species cannot change the name, right? So yeah, so that is why it is inappropriate to name after people. And taxonomy, even uh, there are accusations that people, I can, I mean, there is no harm in naming after anybody, right? I can name after my, you know, my spouse, there are several instances like that. Or I can name after my vice chancellor because he's, you know, uh, he gave me a job. Many people do that. You know, even naming after money, you pay money, I will name after you. So that kind of things are also pretty common in taxonomy, you know. And uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, you know, I don't like that practice. Again, there has been incidences. Uh, there has been some incidences, uh, you know, in Kerala, you might have read, I also read, I don't know exactly, I haven't read the paper, uh, after politicians, a very bad practice, you know, naming after politicians. I think it was named after V.S. Achudanandan, the, the species. What is the point of naming after politicians? So I'm, I'm uh, against these practices, okay? So now after that, okay, of course, we had uh, yet another a line of evidence, uh, which is coming from the DNA sequence. We sequenced the DNA, we constructed the, the phylogenetic tree, and of course that our new species did not cluster with any uh, non-species inside the bryum, you know, and the nearest match was less than 96 percentage, which is a common cutoff uh, value for describing it as a new species. So then we wanted to find a, a, a name. So then why not uh, Bharati? You know, Parati is the name of the station. In its vicinity, I found this new species. Plus, Parati is also a synonym of uh, goddess of Saraswati, you know, goddess of learning. So though I'm not a believer, I'm not a religious person, but still learning is really important. Lifelong learning is extremely important. And that is how the science works, right? You have to learn whenever you fail. And that spirit of learning is really important. The third reason is, of course, Bharat. I was part of Indian Antarctic mission. So by all means, Bharatian say uh, looks to be the perfect uh, combination, you know? 
And uh, now let me tell you about the behind the scenes story. So how did I end up going to Antarctica, right? So, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, Antarctica, you know, it's really interesting. So I was part of this Indian Antarctic mission, which is, uh, I, I would I'd rather like to say I was privileged to be part of this program. So it's not that easy to get in. So that doesn't mean that you have to be a professor or a scientist to go there. You can, even a student can apply. In our team of around 100 people, there were around seven lady students, okay? So if you are a girl student and if you think that, okay, going to Antarctica, I don't think I can do that. No, think again, you can do it. You can approach to the Ministry of Earth Sciences. If you read, uh, you know, the employment news, every year the advertisement comes, you know, call for uh, this uh, Indian Antarctic mission. So you can apply for it. You need a solid proposal to justify why you need to go to Antarctica to do to execute that research. Before going to Antarctica, I've been to 23 countries, you know. So, but Antarctica is really special. The reason is very simple. If you have a lot of money in your bank, 10 crore, 20 crore, you can travel everywhere, but not Antarctica. The reason is Antarctica, there is no tourism, especially in continental Antarctica. Uh, Sub-Antarctican islands like Falkland or peninsula of Antarctica, there are actually voyages, though you are not allowed to uh, set your foot in the continent, but you can just go around, right? But in the continent Antarctica to go, you need to be part of a national mission. Even the passport, you may have seen Indian passport, right? Uh, that is black passport or dark blue color. That is called personal passport. With that, you cannot go there. To go to Antarctica, you need the passport of the same color white passport that is the official passport of the government of india okay. so to get that passport itself you need, your name has to be approved by president of india it's a big privilege and with that official passport you can travel anywhere in the world without visa it's a diplomatic uh, status you know so yes so this uh, land is really interesting because uh, there is the, the the entire continent is only for science no mining no military expansion you know, so uh, no religious activities. Uh, you know, this Antarctica continent itself is the only continent which is completely avoided in any of the holy books. No mention. Of course, the holy books do mention about our, uh, you know, the moon, uh, you know, and constellations, stars, because everybody can see it, right? But Antarctica remained unknown till, uh, you know, 19th century. Can you believe it? Do you know Uranus? Planet Uranus was discovered earlier. It was discovered in the year of 1781, while Antarctica was discovered in 1820. You know, so it is very interesting place. So to go to Antarctica, of course, you have to apply for the project by the ministry. And after that, they will, uh, they will call you to give a presentation in Goa. And after the presentation, if you are selected, then again, that is a conditional. Next stage of the selection procedure is going to AIMS in New Delhi for complete health checkup. So if you drink alcohol or if you smoke, you cannot go because they do, it's not like simple blood test, you know, they do the, even the echocardiogram and treadmill stress test, uh, even the, uh, you know, uh, uh, scanning, everything they do. You might wonder why that much as stringent test. Again, reason is simple, uh, that Antarctica is, really isolated, almost 4,000 kilometers to the nearest civilization. So in case of some mishap, like mild heart attack, chances are high that you cannot be saved. You know, So that is why it is really important. Prospective visitors, if you really want to go, if you think that I would like to go to Antarctica, my number one advice is stop smoking because there is a test called Cortinine. They can find out if you smoke one cigarette in the last two years. You know, so it's it's a cheap five rupees testing, so inexpensive. And even the health insurance or even LICs, these days they conduct this cot night test, right? So, I mean, uh, you know, so quit smoking and quit drinking. These two are the very important messages to convey to you. After that, after that, we underwent a training of three weeks in Himalayas, in a glacier, Sato Panch Glacier, near, uh, you know, Uttarak in, in the Uttarakhand. Uh, yes, yeah, so near Mana village. And it was something like scouts. I was part of Bharat Scouts and Guides. By the way, I was educated in a government school in Malayalam medium, you know. 
So I was part of the Bharat Scouts. You know, the, the, the motto of Bharat Scouts is they are be prepared. Be prepared to face any eventualities in your life. You know, so this key message is actually, it's like a mantra. And if you actually go with that, uh, if you, while visiting either Himalayas or uh, in Antarctica, you have to be very vigilant. You be prepared to face the eventualities. And if you are prepared, then no problem with that. But if you're not prepared, see in Antarctica, even walking is not like normal walking. You know, uh, the reason is that in Antarctica, it's all ice. So you will never know what is underneath the ice. There's something called snow bridge. And the moment you put your foot on the top of that bridge, it can break, it can collapse. And suddenly you are gone deep. That is called crevasse. It could be around 500 meters, half a kilometer. It's a sudden death, you know? Uh, yeah, so it is hypothermal shock plus the, the stress. So, so many people uh, we are losing, even two years back, a student, uh, IIT Hyderabad student, uh, lost his life. So, of course, there is a risk element involved, but it's very worth, you know? So, that is what uh, I would like to tell you. And there are a team of 100 people go every year, and out of which 30 are scientists or the students. So nowadays, uh, the trend is that the professors, uh, you know, especially this uh, professors, what they do is that instead of taking this risk, they send their students, you know? So that, that trend is getting really popular, but I don't like that trend. Why not go there? And if you're experienced with your own eyes and the way that, you know, you might have that curiosity that the students might not have, you know? And, and more than that, I think it's unethical. You know, you're, you're pushing your student to go if the student is not interested to go there. Uh, I don't think that is a, it's a good idea. And of course, the, the risk, it's not just in the, in the continent, but also on the way, you know, there are trade winds, 40 degree, 50 degree and 60 degree. These are called roaring 40s and furious 50s and screaming 60s. You know, your ship will be completely, uh, you know, there's a roaring and pitching. You cannot even sleep in the night. You cannot even eat properly because you know the mess is messy. Right? A lot of risk is there, but I think it's really worth it. And uh, the team also uh, encompass doctors, only medical doctors, you know, no, no pseudoscience, no alternative medicine allowed in the continent of Antarctica. You know, it's only the pure science. The continent is only for science. And also uh, nurses, again, modern medical evidence-based uh, medical nurses are allowed. Uh, and no alternative medicine and also, yeah, so that is what the, the continent is only for the sciences, you know? So, yeah, so this is the ship which I went and also I think you can see the, there is a helicopter here, Airbus. So this, we had two helicopters and the ship is Ivan Papanin. This one is a Russian ship. It's an icebreaker. So you need to have an icebreaker to go to Antarctica. Unfortunately, we don't have, India don't have an icebreaker. So that is why we are renting out with a huge expense, almost 1.5 crore rupees one day. So you need to rent it, not just for one or two days, you need to rent for minimum six months, factoring in the contingencies. So it, it lasts a six month. So see how much money we are spending only for the ship. And all these are, uh, you know, the helicopter, of course, is rented in, a, in an agency. All these things are additional expenses. You know, so yes, yeah, so the risk factor is also extremely important. I have actually detailed everything in my book and the book is called Voyage to Antarctica published by the government of India Press. And the book is also quite inexpensive. Check it out, you can search in Google and the first link you can click to buy the book. Uh, yes, yeah, so I published in 2019. And the Malayalam version is also coming, right? I'm translating this book in Malayalam. And this is our, uh, the station. This is uh, the second station of India established in 1988. The first one was in 1982. Uh, you know, Indian Antarctic mission started in 1981, almost 40 years, right? So that uh, uh, Dakshin Gango 3 was actually commissioned in 1984, but uh, that station was not built properly. It was built on the ice and then it went deep in the ice. But this one is a proper station, but this is not on an ice, but it's on an oasis, you know, ice-free oasis. 
By the way, the stations in Antarctica again are built based on civil engineering principles, not based on any uh, pseudoscience like Vastu. We don't follow, we are not supposed to follow Vastu. We are supposed to follow only evidence-based science there, right? And yes, yeah, so uh, uh, this Antarctica is also a very interesting place where all the longitudes converge. You know, so uh, if you look at the, the globe, so longitudes, right? So longitudes are the, the date determining uh, and time determined, date and time, right? Date and time determining, um, you know, the uh, lines, right? Because all it con converge in Antarctica. So uh, you can technically, you can jump from yesterday to today and today to tomorrow. Very interesting. One jump from yesterday to today and tomorrow, you know? So you can circumnavigate with just one feet. Very interesting, you know, Antarctica is, I mean, if you travel a little bit, the time changes, right? This is Bharat, uh, this is a Maitri station. So yeah, so that is the thing. And this one is our Bharati station. Uh, you know, it, it's the station is not Indian. I mean, it's an Indian station, but it's completely made in Germany. And the, it, you know, this is made up of container ships, shipping container. If you have ever been to Kochi, you know, Patanantita is not too far from Kochi. And if you go to the Kochi uh, ship, uh, Kochin shipyard and the island, you can see the container ships, right? Or you go to, you know, any railway station. I think, um, is it Mavelikera or only one station, right? In Patanantita, I forgot the name of the station. Tiruvallayas, right? So goods carrier train are the same, uh, you know, the container ship. So the entire station is made up of the shipping containers. Very interesting. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And uh, yeah, so coming after, I mean, the, the uh, you know, Brian Bharati and is named after the station, I told you. And what is the impact of this finding and why it matters? So friends, this is the first planned discovery in the 40 years of the Indian Antarctic mission. And that is the reason why it got a lot of media attention right from Germany, Russia, Lithuania, Turkey, UK, Italy. Uh, you might have read this Madhubhumi also covered uh, as, uh, a short news of this, you know, so though it is more uh, reported in international media. So uh, the, the major impact is that before this, there are several papers uh, that, you know, for example, this paper is by my friend, uh, Matt Devey from University of Cambridge. So these papers are based on remote sensing data that indicates that because of the global warming, Antarctica is getting greenified. So greenified means plant species are more and more uh, proliferating in the continent because Antarctica is getting greenified. So, you know, you can actually see that this temperate species can now get introduced into the polar regions, uh, not merely Antarctica, but also Arctic. Arctic, warm, you know, uh, warmifying of the Arctic is very well known. And it's so much faster in Arctic comparing with Antarctic. The reason is again simple. Arctic is part of the Northern hemisphere and Northern hemisphere, if you look at the globe, you can see that uh, most of the continents are on the North. In south is mostly ocean, right? And continents gets, it's a landmass. It can get heated up faster. And more than that, the Arctic is not a continent. Arctic is just glaciers floating on Arctic Ocean. But Antarctica is not like that. Antarctica is a proper continent. And even then Antarctica is getting warmified is that shows how alarming is the global warming. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, and before going to Antarctica, I happened to go to Norway. Norway is a beautiful country, you know? And uh, yeah, so uh, it's, it's a Scandinavian country. I've been to all the Scandinavians except Finland. So I went to a place called Tromso uh, up in the north of Norway uh, and a place called Lofoten Island in the, near the Tromso. So I took a ferry. And while going in the ferry, I was just looking outside. It's a, you know, the window is, glass window. I was looking outside the glass window. I saw mosquitoes. I asked the co-passengers, is it common to find mosquitoes in, uh, uh, you know, in, in Norway? I was not expecting. They said that again, they were not expecting it. Uh, it's like a, a phenomenon in the last 10 years. It happened in the last 10 years. And before that, there were no mosquitoes there. You don't have to go all that far. Even right here in Shimla, for example, if you've been to Shimla, 
10 years back, there were no mosquitoes, but now you can see mosquitoes everywhere. So this is repeated phenomenon happens everywhere, friends, because of the global warming, you know? So now the question comes like, what if the Antarctica melts away? That is what now the predicament, uh, which is now, uh, you know, so consensus by the Geological Society of America. So the American geologists, they say that within next 50 years, Antarctica, we might lose that entire continent. It will be completely melted because the global rate is now extremely high, the accelerated global warming. What are the repercussions? Of course, 1.5 degrees Celsius is the increase within five years. You know, next five years, the decrease, what is predicted. Last week, the paper has come. And you might know IPCC report has also published last month, right? I cover all this in my channel. I also have a channel. I will put a link there. And I also have a curiosity. The curiosity is a science show. Every month I release one show, you know. And 50 years, the breakup of Antarctica. So, of course, the obvious repercussion is the sea level increase. The sea level will be increasing by many meters. And, you know, uh, increased sea level will have definitely have repercussions on low-lying areas, uh, like even the Kochi. You know, and even Mumbai, are we factoring this for the real estate? If you are from Mumbai, you will be shocked. Yes, you, you might be paying like 10 crore, 20 crore rupees for one flat. And what if within 50 years that entire area becomes submerged? Is the insurance companies are factoring in? No, this is going to be really terrific, I tell you. And it's not just sea level increase, but also it, it will have ramifications on the rotation of the earth. You know, so with the entire Antarctic uh, melted away, so this will slow down the axial rotation of the earth. That means the days are going to be longer. And that means because the days are getting longer, uh, you know, the sunlight exposure will also get longer and that will have, uh, you know, a cascading effect on global warming. So that is really going to be tough. And But more than that, what is there underneath the Antarctic ice sheet? If you have read books of Dan Brown, like uh, Da Vinci Code and Deception Point, this was a, the theme in the Deception Point. Could there be any next coronavirus in it? There could be. Pathogens might be there underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. There has been a study published uh, last month by Ohio University, Ohio State University, they did this work in Indian, uh, I mean, it's, it's in Himalaya, but not in Indian Himalaya, but Tibetan side. The glaciers of Himalaya, they found 15,000 years old viruses. If such discoveries are coming from not too far away and also that from the, the glaciers, there could be pathogens lurking underneath the ice sheets, you know? So that is what the ramifications are tremendous. So another impact is on the work on extremophile. You know, of course, this MOS is an extremophile. And any work on extremophiles will provide us cues about origin of life on the planet Earth. The abiogenesis. How did the abiogenesis happen? And also, it gives you clues about what to look for in extraterrestrial life. You know, astrobiology or cosmobiology, the search for life in the universe. So what to look for? So it's actually, this, the reason is very simple why Antarctica is, uh, it's a heaven for astrobiologists. It's so much similar to other celestial bodies. The temperature in Antarctica can go all the way to minus 79 degrees Celsius, very, very cold. It's just like Enceladus, the moon. You know, and also what is underneath the Antarctic ice sheet, this is me, you see that uh, nothing is exposed because it's extremely cold and it's extreme UV light too. The ozone hole is in Antarctica. Today is, do you know, today is a very special day. Today is a UN International Day for blue skies and clean air or blue skies for clean air, you know. So, yeah, so this is, uh, uh, you know, in Antarctica, I mean, ozone day is also coming this month. Uh, yeah, so the hole in the ozone layer is right above Antarctica. So that is the reason why Antarctica is, the UV light is also very high. It's quite similar to Enceladus and other celestial objects. And what is underneath this sheet, you might wonder. So the sheet, Antarctic ice sheet is approximately four kilometers in thickness, four, 4,000 meters, you can dig deep. 
And where will it end? Ocean? No, it's a proper continent. So there is rock underneath. So those, uh, you know, the, the ice sheet touching the rock, there are several lakes underneath the ice sheet. And these lakes are, uh, you know, water. It's not frozen. Liquid water is there. So these are something called subglacial lakes, just like uh, celestial bodies like Enceladus and Europa. And there are actually secret rivers underneath this ice sheet. River, by the way, like Pamba, you know, Patanandita has called Pamba River, right? So river, when you hear this name, you know, the river flows down the hill towards the ocean, right? So how about river? Can you ever even imagine a river that flows uphill? Yes, you can find that in Antarctica, very special place, right? Because of the hydrostatic pressure, it's something like syringe pressing, right? Uh, the, the liquid, so the liquid can actually go uphill through the secret river-like conduits inside Antarctica. And there are volcanoes too. So all these things are quite like Mars, for example. Mars has all these things, you know, surface temperature of Mars is it's much more warmer than Antarctica, you know, it's minus 63 degrees, but it can go all the way to 27 degrees near the equator. Of course, Antarctica you won't find that kind of temperature, 27 degrees unheard of, you know. So, and Enceladus is most reflective among the moon, moon is, by the way, is nothing but natural satellite. Most reflective because it's all ice. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn, you know. And the uh, average surface temperature is very cold, minus 201 degree, and it's most reflective. And Cassini probe, the NASA's probe, they found continuous icy gush near the pole, you know. And this is another very interesting uh, uh, celestial body, Titan, which is the, the largest moon of Saturn. And of course, the second largest moon in our entire solar system. Temperature is just like Antarctica, very slow, very, very low, minus 179. But the beauty is that the Titan has got a very thick atmosphere, just like Antarctica or rest of Earth. And just like Earth, uh, the atmosphere of Titan is mostly nitrogen. And uh, there is a liquid water underneath this, uh, in, inside this Titan, which has been, you know, uh, which has been detected by Cassini and Hugens probe. The so Hugens is by ESA, right? And how about Ganymede, my favorite among these moons? So Ganymede is the largest moon of Jupiter. If you have a low power telescope, you can easily spot Ganymede. You know, if you look towards the Jupiter, you can see it. And Ganymede is just like Antarctica, you know, it has got Aurora too, because this is the only a moon with its own magnetic field. Uh, Antarctica also has Aurora, you know, Aurora uh, Australis, like Aurora Borealis on the north. Uh, this is called Aurora Australis. I will just show you some pics of Aurora, which I clicked. Southern Lights. And the Hubble have revealed that there are underwater, seawater ocean in the Ganymede, you know. And yes, yeah, so uh, oxygen is also there in its atmosphere, just like, uh, you know, the uh, Antarctica, I would like to say. It's a rocky like Antarctica. The latest finding is that there is water vapor in its atmosphere, you know? So by all means, it looks just like, uh, you know, the Earth or uh, Antarctica and Europa, finally, the smallest moon of Jupiter. And there has been a report of water plume from the South Pole detected by Galileo mission. And the maximum surface temperature is also very, very low, minus 160 degrees near the equator. You know, and by all means, so is it only that the similarity with uh, the uh, celestial object, the reason why Antarctica is very special for astrobiologists? No, you can also see it because, you know, March equinox is 21st, around 20th or 21st. I was there in Antarctica, you know, near the Maitri station when I spotted this uh, 20, uh, the March equinox. So March equinox is the only day where Antarctica gets its sunset. Remember I told you only one sunset in one year. And after this March equinox till September equinox, it's pitch dark. So no photosynthetic organisms can live. And uh, this one, this picture, this one is actually an optical illusion called sun dog because of 
double refraction of the sun rays in diamond dust. I really don't have any time to explain all this phenomenon. Please check out everything is there in this book, Voyage to Antarctica, okay? So once, uh, you know, this March equinox happens, Antarctica slips into six months of pitch dark, and this is a perfect time for astronomical observations. This is my own pick of our own galaxy. The Milky Way, you know, the, the center of this galaxy exists one massive black hole. Again, that's a new discovery. And during the months of, uh, uh, you know, the winter in Antarctica can spot this Aurora Australis, nothing but mesmerizing Southern lights, you know, light show and the dances and the colors are proportional to the molecule that gets excited. So this is the same principle behind astronomical spectroscopy. So remember the Ganymede, I told you that it has got oxygen. All these things are by the spectroscopic measurement. And there are massive telescopes in Antarctica, like South Pole Telescope, which is microwave. It's not even photon. And because it is based on microwave, you can work on year round. Other telescopes like photon telescopes, you know, light telescopes, you can work only during the winter months in Antarctica because summertime, a lot of light everywhere, the sun never sets. It's very bizarre. 12 o'clock in the noon time is quite same. The light is quite same. The intensity is same at 12 o'clock in the midnight. So intensity never fluctuates. So it's really, really bizarre. So there are so much of the avenues for astronomy. And this, uh, you know, you might remember two years back, there has been a very interesting, uh, you know, the, a picture of the black hole, the event horizon picture, right? So all these pictures were taken with the help of telescopes installed in, uh, you know, in Antarctica. Unfortunately, India has no telescopes there, though we have two stations there. And yeah, so through their collective effort of multiple nations, we have now 4,000 confirmed exoplanets, you know? So out of this 4,000 ex exoplanet is the, basically the planet beyond the solar system. So out of this, there are four planets which might harbor life. The exobiologist's dream, you know, they're working on it. These are Kepler 1649C, then Proxima Centauri B, and uh, Gliese 1061D and C. These are the exoplanets that might harbor life. You know, astronomy has been India's original fort, right? Aryabhatta and Paskara. But unfortunately, ISRO don't have any astronomical wing, although uh, their, uh, you know, analogous organizations abroad like JAXTA in Japan, ESA in Europe, or NASA, their, their strong focus is on astronomy, the basic sciences, not utilitarian, you know? And Antarctica is also heaven- uh, for you know, this is my own pick. This is taken from a uh, helicopter. So, the beauty is that Antarctica is a white continent, and whatever black you can easily spot. These are nothing but emperor penguins, a march of penguins. You can spot penguins easily because uh, the contrast, you know. And because of this contrast, it's so much easy to pick rocks on Antarctica. And these rocks are. Uh, chances that these rocks are meteorites are extremely high. So almost 99.9% .9 of very well-known meteorites are all taken from Antarctica. Because you simply wander around the Antarctic, uh, you know, the sheets. And if you happen to see some rock, then chances are high that it's a, it's a meteorite. And why Antarctica is it? Antarctica is, uh, you know, it's like a magnet attracting the meteorite? No. Meteorites are everywhere in the world, but you cannot spot the meteorite in other places, right? But in Antarctica, it's easy to spot. And two of the most famous meteorite in the history of the exobiology, these are called Allen Hillis 84001 and Yamato 000593. Both have been collected from Antarctica. These are Martian meteorites. Basically, these are pieces of the Martian rock from Mars, planet Mars, you know? So, that is what uh, Antarctica matters. So I suggest you please check out the call for, by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. You can apply for it. And you don't have to club with your teacher. If you're a student, even students can apply, even girls can apply. Yes, go ahead and apply for it. You know, and yes, yeah, so uh, there had been, uh, uh, you know, there had been uh, uh, a girl, Malayali girl student uh, who came with me uh, in our group, Lima. 
and uh, yes, so she was actually doing a PhD, uh, I mean, pursuing PhD from uh, uh, Hyderabad, ISRO in Hyderabad. So not only PhD students, even master's student, if you have an interesting idea, why not? You can apply for it. That's it about uh, my Antarctic trip. But I, before uh, winding up, I would like to introduce, this is my another, yet another discovery, which I made on acetabular area, Jilla Kannikai. The name is uh, inspired from uh, Hans Christian Andersen's a little mermaid that is fairy tale and yes yeah, so this is you know this is actually uh, i mean this is in the the design is really intricate it's like umbrella shape right umbrella or wine glass of a mermaid it's it's from andaman and nicobar islands you know and again that that has gotten media in the bbc the front page it has come and several other international media too and now many people ask me what is actually use of this this particular moss or this uh, acetabulary at Chilakanyikai, what is the use of it? And this is the same question that the, the today's students have to face when you give a talk in, you know, like PhD defense. Examiners will ask, okay, you, you worked on, uh, you know, uh, this kind of algae, what is the use of it? Yeah, that utilitarian mindset is the, the root cause of uh, I think that is the main cause why uh, the Indian science is declining worldwide, even though the ranks are coming up, not a single Nobel Prize is coming to India, you know, uh, after C.V. Raman, again, C.V. Raman got his science Nobel uh, before the independence, right? Post-independence, not a single Indian Nobel Prize winners in sciences. So we have to actually foster this sort of curiosity driven, uh, you know, the basic sciences which doesn't look for the utility. There is a very famous essay by American educationist, you know, Abraham Flexner, way back in uh, 1939, the title of the essay is The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. You know, so in that essay, he wrote, curiosity, which may or may not eventuate in something useful, is probably the outstanding characteristic of the modern thinking. It's not new. It goes back to Galileo, Bacon, to Sir Isaac Newton, and it must be absolutely unhampered. You know, that the curiosity driven basic sciences. Uh, you know, uh, my cousin used, used to ask me the question like, uh, look, uh, you know, uh, whatever he calls me. He used to say like, whatever the things that we have in our life, everyday life, for example, fan or TV or airplane, you know? So are these all because of the academic research? Lab court won academicians are the, the behind all these discoveries? No, most of these are actually done by non-academicians. You know, the prototype of uh, the airplane or so was by Leonardo da Vinci, right? Ornithopter. It was a prototype and the, the execution was done by Wright brothers. Uh, they were just, uh, you know, uh, just uh, in, in their house backyard. They were having a, uh, you know, the workshop and the executor. How about Velcro strips uh, on your bag and, you know, on your, uh, this one, the uh, shoes, you know, that Velcro, right? Again, that's a curiosity driven a Swiss scientist. He was just walking on a morning and when he came back, with his dog, he went for a walk, and then he saw that the pollen and seeds have been, uh, you know, it is sticked onto his cot and the fur of his dog. He did a scanning electron microscopy to see that complementarity in the ultra structure. And he thought, well, why not design something similar? He designed and he patented it. Zip, for example, anything which you, even CRISPR Cas friends, you might think that CRISPR Cas is born by. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, targeted, goal-oriented research. No, p-value was not. Even uh, antibiotics, antibiotic penicillin, you know the story, right? It was completely curiosity-driven, basic sciences. So he, just out of curiosity, he was just looking why there are hallows uh, in the penicillium colonies. So that eventually turned out to save millions of the life worldwide. So in summary, uh, all these discoveries are product of childlike curiosity, which we should always foster in our life, uh, you know, and uh, this kind of blue skies research. So what is the application? That question doesn't merit any significance. 
and the work in Antarctica, whatever be, and especially the kind of work that I do, are important because these are uh, these provide clues to survival strategies of the extremophiles, and that in turn might give cues to the origin of life and astrobiological research, and exploratory research in general, and that in Antarctica in particular, uh, because it's a science continent offers exciting avenues of research, including astronomical observation, if you're from physics background, meteorite hunting, or for study of extremophiles. And before concluding, I would like to introduce, this is a science show. Uh, I'm just sharing the link to the, the, you know, the, the YouTube of my channel. And uh, the, the, I'm also part of this, I, you know, during the, uh, a pandemic last year, I initiated this effort of Young Academy of India, which is a community of lifelong learners. Anybody can be part of our academy, it's completely free. And we also have this program called Mentex. Mentex is mentor mentee ideological matchmaking. So if you would like to do uh, an internship, science internship, for example, during summer, summer, uh, you know, internship, you can apply for it. The call is still open. This call is basically the autumn 2021 call is open. And we have every year, there are two calls, autumn and spring. And guess what? The results of these calls are declared on equinox, sun, sunrise and sunset in Antarctica. There's a link I'll just share in the chat box and thanks for having me. And uh, yes, yeah, so I would like to stop here. and.